James Rosenquist came from Minnesota to New York City to study art. Here he supported himself as a billboard painter and even ended up working on billboards in Times Square. The experience introduced several features of the style he would evolve, vast scale and dramatic close-ups without any of the detail you'd expect from a close-up, say the pores on someone's face. Painted up close and seen up close, the details seem abstract and because they're so big, they feel like fragments because you can't always see how they all fit together or even if they fit together at all. As Rosenquist famously put it, quote, I'm interested in contemporary vision, the flicker of chrome, reflections, rapid associations, quick flashes of light. Bing bang, bing bang, I don't do anecdotes, I accumulate experiences, unquote. So his was a style well suited to that fragmentary flickering view that he identified with contemporary life. Rosenquist's Marilyn Monroe of 1962 is a good starting point because it shows three influences on the artist. The collaged and fragmented look makes you think of Picasso of Cubism. Take, for example, how we actually see portions of her face twice, straight on and upside down at the upper right. And there's a portion of her name, Marilyn, right ways, right side up, superimposed over a portion of it upside down. And then there's the way those fragments recombine an issue which suggests surrealist convulsion. See how in the lower right, the hand and wrist fill out the missing jaw, and the fingers seem to continue the corners of the lips. Finally, there's the theme of subliminal sex, the kind of things that you would find in an advertisements. The only features that stand out against the abstract, undetailed plane of her face, a kind of face that appears in fashion ads, is a, a dreamy uh, face on which you can project your fantasies. Well, the only parts that are clear and crisp are the eyes and mouths, both of these things, by the way, items that the surrealists viewed as interchangeable and that conjured thoughts of sex organs. Just think of Hans Bellmer with his uh, biomorphic explosive figures, eruptions of buttocks and uh, breasts, hips, eyes, testicles, etc. Finally, in addition to the come-hither face that looks at us, is the swooning face of Marilyn upside down, as if we're looking at her on a bed. Imitating how ads worked subliminally, the sex undertones were entirely intentional. White Cigarette of 1961 presents undetailed fragments, a hand with a cigarette, the neck of a bottle, a woman's knees, a tipped glass, the juxtaposition of cigarette with bottle, of course, suggests something more than just smoking and drinking. The two relate sexually. One male, the other, an orifice, is female. In fact, it's unmistakably female because it's right over the woman's lap. The tottering glass below in this shaped canvas, canvas that expands where the bottom of the glass is, just so happens to be positioned so that it would receive the flow from the bottle right above the woman's legs. In other words, there's an implication of significant wetness here. Also, the glass itself suggests a theme in art that goes back to 17th century Holland and beyond. The glass, a vessel that teeters on the verge of being broken, a symbol of lost virginity. In Mask, Come Play With Me, Let's Go For A Ride, also of 1961, we see the fragmented, undetailed close-up of a woman's face and the neck of a bottle. Well, here the sexual overtones, overtones implicit in juxtaposing her mouth with the neck of the bottle are pretty obvious. Notice that among the drips on the bottle's neck is a shape that looks oddly like a blockheaded sperm. Rosenquist's most notable painting of the period is F-111 of 1965, an 86-foot long canvas that wrapped around four walls of a room in Leo Castelli's gallery, where it was originally shown. The two parts you see here connect, the top one on the left, the bottom on the right. F-111 is Rosenquist's Guernica, but about the Vietnam War. The critic John Russell put it well when he said how a man plans a fifth child in a third automobile because he has a contract to produce weapons and that some little girls were living high on the hog because other little girls were being burned alive. The picture superimposes views of modern life and modern horror onto a life-sized rendition of an F-111 fighter plane. 
It was developed in the mid-60s and finally went into service in Vietnam in 1967, two years after Rosenquist's painting was done. From the rear of the plane, you see a tire with a similarly formed factory-made angel food cake. Then there's a girl in a hairdryer that looks like it's the tip of a missile on her head. Then there's an atom bomb blast under a beach umbrella. Then a cigarette whose smoke looks like some kind of other bomb. Then canned spaghetti that looks like ripped open guts. And at the very front, there's a reflective panel where visitors could basically see themselves implicated in the system. The message? Middle class American prosperity came as a consequence of a military industrial complex that made the world safe for capitalist materials and markets, all at the expense of unfortunates in faraway lands. How it's cubist, with its splintered point of view and collage aesthetic, is pretty obvious. How it's surrealist is obvious too. Here, images become convulsive. Take, for example, the spaghetti, which also blends in convulsively with the odd forms to the left of it. The huge incongruous scale is surrealist too. If the spaghetti were actual size, you'd be a lot less likely to think of it as intestines. Rosenquist and Leo Castelli had intended for the piece to be sold in sections because they couldn't imagine any single buyer paying so much for the whole of it. So Rosenquist actually designed it so that the image of the plane would disappear as the pieces were sold, even as it remained there, all along, hidden. But along came Edith and Robert Skull, a couple made nouveau riche by a taxicab empire. They bought the entire work, and they paid a record price for it, too. It was a record for a contemporary artist, and it was especially astonishing, because here was an artist who was still at the beginning of his career. They paid $45,000 for it. At the time, it was so remarkable that the New York Times treated it as news for its front page. Turns out the skulls were pretty shrewd. They loaned the painting to every major show they could find to make it as famous as they could. And in 1973, they sold it for a vast, undisclosed sum.